Fantastic. And yeah, so please do give us your ideas. Um, and that reminds me of another thank you I want to make, which is to say thank you to everyone who submitted a proposal to be part of the programme today. We have got an incredibly um, distinguished group of speakers and presenters, but we really could have offered a completely different programme today just because of the quality and um, breadth of the different proposals that came in. So it, it, we had to make some hard decisions to squeeze into the program today. But what the podcast means is, of course, that many of the people who we didn't quite manage to get them into the program, we can now go back to them and we won't be losing that chance to showcase the great work that they're doing anytime soon. So thank you again to, to everyone who um, engaged with the whole process and, and submitted a proposal. So I mentioned that we want today to be as interactive as possible. So we're going to get your fingers working on the Zoom polls and um, we're going to have our first poll coming up right now, our first polling question. And this is going to be about us getting to know who, where we stand, what's the state of play? How committed are all of your workplaces to actually tackling the climate crisis? And when I say your workplace, it could be an institution, an agency, an organization. Do you think that they're really doing everything in their power or could there be more? You know, the next option for the answer, are they doing, could be doing a whole lot more. My guess is that that might be the one that comes up with the most answers and that's kind of how it's looking, but I, I don't want to influence that. Um, but yes, we, I, I'm not sure that we certainly within the international education sector are yet at the point where every organization or institution could really say they're hundred percent committed and giving it any, everything they've got. Um, I think we've got most people, have, a lot of people have voted now, so maybe we'll just share those results. Yeah, so 10% really 100% committed, so well done to them. 73% where you think that you know, the level of ambition and commitment in your workplace could be more. 13% um, where it's not on the radar, 4% if you're not sure. So um, I think what that tells us is that there is a need for this kind of event and for the kind of knowledge that we're sharing here today and will continue to share over the coming weeks and months. And really, ideally, what we would like to do as Kenny is make ourselves obsolete so that um, everybody was 100% committed and we, we, don't, we can all go back to ballroom dancing or, or knitting or whatever it is that we, we used to do in our spare time. Okay. Um, Thank you so much, everybody, and for that. And that gives us a good head start on the polling. We know that that works. So I'm going to go straight into our first main session now. And this is one that I think everyone is going to be very interested in because it goes right to the heart of the practical steps that each of us can take to try and reduce the carbon footprint of our own professional and even perhaps personal lives, because we're going to look at pathways to sustainable travel. And I'm absolutely delighted today to be able to invite the, um, our very good um, Canny Europe team member and um, professor of, from Champlain University in Ireland, Professor Stephen Robinson, who's going to moderate this next session for us. Hello everyone, and welcome to the first session of Canny's European Summit, a session we've titled Paths Towards Sustainable International Travel. I'm Stephen Robinson, and I'll be your moderator for this session. We're joined today by Martina Bellanzona from the University of Pavia in Italy, Sean Pickering from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, and Mark Blakemore from the Foundation for International Education, or FIE, in England. Each of these presenters will have about a five minute video presentation, and then we'll be, we'll be ready for about 12 minutes of Q&A. You can post questions at any time by using the Q&A function. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Martina, our first presenter. Good afternoon, everybody. 
Um, thanks for organizing the event and for the chance to be here and give you a snapshot of our strategy to conciliate internationalization activities and climate action. So the, the strategy that we are implementing at the University of Pavia lays on three main pillars. Uh, they include a different set of activities from digitalization of activities to greening students stay in Pavia, in our town. However, in this plan, greening the international mobility truly represents a priority to us as it includes the most environmentally impacting activities that we carry out at the International Relations Office. So uh, the plan that we have produced uh, derives from some considerations. Uh, first of all, the consideration of the amount of people undertaking international travels for study purposes. Um, in this sense, indeed, it is interesting to uh, notice that under the Erasmus program, so the European program, the major European program for mobility in the frame of higher education, uh, 10 million people have undertaken international travels in uh, uh, 10 years. So a truly massive number of, uh, of people moving abroad. And um, well, um, it is also interesting to keep in mind that airplane is uh, uh, by far the most uh, um, the mode of transport most widely uh, employed by students when traveling abroad. And also, it is interesting to to see that the environmental impact of the mode of transport is pretty much overlooked, and students rather choose the mode of transport from from an economic perspective. So after uh, these considerations, we have designed a plan that overall aims at promoting alternative sustainable transportation system. And the first goal that we want to achieve is that of empowering students to travel greener. And we want to achieve this by uh, granting financial, student, financial incentives to students. So uh, the students who choose sustainable transportation, mainly uh, I'm referring to train travels, will receive financial aid in order to, um, to undertake this green travel. Also the financial um, perspective, uh, the financial approach of our strategy will be backed up by an overall activity of awareness raising um, about the carbon footprint deriving from air travels and awareness raising on the importance of avoiding air travels as much as possible. And we'll be also encouraging students to travel uh, by train as a means to explore Europe more deeply and strengthening their European identity. So this four set of activities is uh, conceived to uh, empower students to avoid air travel as much as possible. When this is not feasible, however, we plan on um, implementing carbon offsetting activities through tree planning. And tree planning will be uh, carried out locally in order to ensure tangible benefits to the community. Then uh, the benefits I'm referring to include um, the power of urban forests to break the so-called heat highlands phenomenon, uh, but also the power of trees to cool air and uh, mitigating climate change, filtering pollutants, etc. So. In implementing um, carbon offsetting activities, we want to make sure that our priorities are related to internationalization and um, climate action uh, also match European uh, cross cutting priorities, such as indeed uh, renewing our cities, making them smarter, making them greener, and using uh, nature-based solutions to mitigate climate change. So in this sense, we'll be uh, very much matching European priorities. So for the sake of brevity, I am uh, closing here my presentation, but I'll be available in a Q&A session, and you can always send me an email for any further information. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sean Pickering. I'm a project coordinator at the Department of Social Responsibility and Sustainability at the University of Edinburgh. I'm here today to talk to you about how we've embedded a climate conscious approach to our business travel. How this fits in with the wider university is that in 2016, the university released a zero by 2040 climate strategy in which there were targets for reducing scope one, two and three emissions, business travel fitting within scope three. 
More recently, the university has released its strategy to 2030, which has four key themes, which you can see on the, the right hand side there. One of which is social and civic responsibility. Zero by 2040 fits very nicely into that theme. When we're looking at business travel, what we're going to talk to you about today are stage one and two on this diagram, which collectively are understanding our travel, as well as stage five, which is initiating a university wide working group and the recommendations put forward to that by that working group in stage six. So, understanding our data. What we've been doing over the last few years is collating data from a range of our suppliers, so our travel management company, internal expenses, as well as individual taxi, coach, and car companies. And we have built our own processor, data processor, and it gives us an output graph similar to this on the left hand side here. Now, this is an interactive graph. So, if you want to go, and it's publicly available, I should say. Um, so, if you want to go and see it, if you go to the link at the bottom there and follow it through, that'll take you through to the graph, as well as talk to you about how we've what method we've used behind that. Now, as you can see, the emissions have been growing steadily since 2012, up to 15% year on year. Uh, and there's a big drop in 1920 due to the impact of COVID, where travel at the university was stopped from March onwards. In the year previous to that, 1819, we recorded over 110,000 journeys. And across um, these journeys, we spent over 11 million pounds on the travel alone. So that doesn't take into account the accommodation, the food, the visas, for example, where the costs would then rise to about 18 to 20 million pounds in that one year. Over that year, again, we emitted over 18 and a half thousand tons of CO2 equivalent, which is the same as roughly a thousand average UK homes in the year. So on from that, what we then did, or have done alongside that, is to understand our traveller behaviours. So we run a series of focus groups and surveys across the university across the years, and the, the information that we get back is very similar um, year on year. What we find, and unsurprisingly to yourself maybe, is that academia necessitates travel, whether it's for networking, collaboration, attendance and presenting at conferences, for example, huge range of reasons why travel um, has to happen at university. And that for academics, if they don't travel, they feel that there's a risk to their research, there's a risk to career progression, and potentially they could lose their jobs. What we have then done is taken this information and we've set up or we had approval by the university to set up a travel and aviation working group. This group brought together representatives from across the university, whether it was academic staff, professional staff and students, to look at how we can reduce business travel emissions whilst also enhancing our learning, teaching and research at a global stage. And we did this by initiating what we call climate conscious travel. And what this looks like, the recommendations that we put forward, you can see in front of you. So we aim to reduce as many um, journeys as we can, and that's by providing better information to travellers before they travel and as, as well as after they travel as well. We also look at how we can link in the research that we have to examine the travel and higher education in more detail to see what barriers are still there and what new barriers might come up as we develop new systems. And we continue to work with others across the sector to initiate with a wider change. So, for example, we are a key member of the Roundtable of Sustainable Academic Travel, a network of over 100 institutions globally who are looking to address their carbon emissions from business travel. And this network looks to share data, to share knowledge, um, and show the pathway that we've taken and how we can learn from others as well. We then look at how we can replace certain modes of transport, high carbon modes of transport with low carbon modes of transport. So in the UK, there's, we are looking to instigate a presumption against flights within mainland Great Britain. This means that changing flights to rail. Now, where rail isn't an option, which is from Edinburgh quite significantly um, because of a large part of the world, we look at how we can develop and support virtual collaboration tools. So, whereas staff might be more familiar with Zoom and Teams, for example, and other software, um, there's still that support level needed. So, should something go wrong, they know who they can contact as well. And we understand that not all travel is going to be removed. So, we need to address the remaining carbon from this travel. And to do that, what we have uh, decided to do is we are looking to initiate a university controlled carbon sequestration scheme. And what this looks like is still up for debate. However, we, we feel that a direct scheme is more beneficial because it can we can link it in with other key factors such as research and community benefits as well. And we can guarantee the longevity of that scheme. We're also looking at piloting a carbon charge for flights. So potentially that might part fund the carbon sequestration, but also it acts as a behaviour change mechanism as well, which is obviously more important to reduce the travel altogether. So that's a very brief summary of 
what we've done here at the University of Edinburgh. I'm available for questions in the Q&A after this session, and I'll be here for the networking, or you can contact me on those details that you see just there. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Mark Blakemore, and I'm the Chief Marketing and Recruitment Officer at FIE. FIE is a study abroad provider, and we specialise in studying internship programmes in the UK and Ireland. And today I'm going to talk to you about sustainability at FIE. Some years ago, FIE identified that sustainability in study abroad had the, the inherent paradox that we're all aware of. That is, in order for students to study abroad, that they have to travel. And by definition, traveling produces CO2 and other greenhouse gases. Some years ago, we w went on to enunciate three strands of uh, an FIE future, which was sustainable. And they were respectively um, educating students before and during uh, their time studying with us, um, reusing and reducing. And finally, and this is what we're here to speak about today, um, offsetting, specifically carbon. Seven years ago, FIE made the decision to offset flights for all staff in the UK and Ireland going to North America. A short time afterwards, our development team within the United States itself started to offset flights as well. And finally, um, last year, we made the broader decision to offset all student return flights from mainland USA to London or, or Dublin. The, the question we faced some years ago when we first started considering this was how to go about offsetting being a study abroad provider, it's not what we do. And so we needed to partner. The first thing we did was to do our homework before we reached out to anybody. And we identified three criteria of how we would choose a partner. The first thing we wanted to do was to ensure that any partner calculated their, calculated the carbon emissions comprehensively. We knew that the International Carbon Reduction and Offset Alliance, ICROA, required all members to have a comprehensive method of calculation. So that was almost our gold standard we used. We, we all know, for instance, that CO2 is not the only greenhouse gas that's emitted. Nitrous oxide, for instance, does a huge amount of damage. So we were looking for a, an organisation that looked at all emissions, all greenhouse gases, not just CO2. That was the first criteria that we had. The second criteria that we had in choosing a partner <clears throat> was demonstrable proof points. We knew at the time that carbon offsetting it can be quite a woolly term. We needed something that all staff and in time students would be able to look to to see how what we were doing was being realised. And, and any part that really needed to have visual proof on their website of what they were doing with our um, investment. Of course, carbon offsetting involves carbon finance, which in itself is an investment. And I, I'm giving the game away here about who we eventually went to. We, we've partnered with Climate Care, which is um, an Oxford, England-based organization. You, you can see here that Climate Care um, ha has a very clear and easy to see website. Um, it, it's very easy to navigate, very easy to use. Um, this is just one of 15 pages, this is a snippet from one of 15 pages they have um, looking at where carbon investments go to. Um, we opted to for our investments to go into um, cook stoves, but it could have been in rainforest um, in investments or, or wells, for instance. So that was our second set of criteria. The third was a means for staff and students to assess their carbon impact. And I'm saying carbon impact, it should really be greenhouse gas emissions impact, because as I showed you in criteria one, um, we were looking at um, this comprehensive perspective of offsetting, not just carbon itself. So the means for staff and students to assess their carbon impact was quite simply a carbon calculator. And you can see here that Climate Care's carbon calculator um, is now on our website. This is a snippet from our own website. So that, that was the three sets of criteria we used in order to choose our partner, which eventually became Climate Care. I'm almost out of time, so just a few closing thoughts before we go to Q&A. 
that the biggest hurdle that any of us will face is the, is, uh, the financial commitment internally. You really need to have this agreed by your CFO, or at least the, the president to help push this through. Just put this in context, um, a car to offset a flight from New York City to London or Dublin, it's about $20 return. Um, from Los Angeles, it's about 26. Another piece of advice I can give you is being clear about what carbon offsetting actually is. It, it's an investment. It, carbon offsetting is quite a woolly term, but you make an investment and it has other knock-on effects for social justice in the countries that you be, your investment credits will be going towards. And finally, if that isn't enough, this is really positive for your own branding and, and recruitment efforts. Obviously, Generation Z are very sensitive towards sustainability and carbon offsetting is, is a big flashing green light. I think I'm out of time. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you very much, Martina, Sean and Mark, for some very informative presentations. We have now about 10 or 12 minutes for question and answer. And I see we have some Q&A questions we'll get to in a second. Once we have launched our very short poll, we are looking to see um, the progress that you may have made at your institution. So please choose one of those four options. Yes, we have a number of actions in place and we've seen a reduction in carbon emissions from our travel. Yes, we have committed to reducing travel emissions and actions will be put in place shortly or no, our institution is just getting around to considering the carbon emissions from travel, or no, our institution is yet to address carbon emissions from travel. <clears throat> We're going to uh, look at the answers to the, that poll uh, towards the end of our, our Q&A session. And my, my first question here has come through the Q&A uh, box, and it is for Martina at the University of Pavia. How has the emphasis on train travel been received by the students? And has this been included as part of the co-curricular visits and more recreational travel? Okay, uh, well, so, um, hello, hello everybody, hello Steven. Uh, the plan that I uh, talked to you about is um, indeed actually in, a first, uh, in its first phases. So we still are uh, delivering it and we're still are working on the features and details of the plan itself. So it was not delivered yet to students, but we're confident it's gonna be uh, very much welcomed by students. And um, I forgot the second part of the question, uh, but uh, well, we have some data coming from uh, other associations working with students in the frame of Erasmus, and they are really encouraging, showing that students are more and more uh, keen towards uh, traveling greener. And uh, so an economic uh, aid would be instrumental in this sense. So we're confident uh, this initiative would be really welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna turn now to Mark. Um, Mark, you made mention of climate concern and carbon offsetting as being something that the, that appeals to the Generation Z students. Um, your, your offsetting scheme has been running for, for a while now. How have the students reacted to that? And how can you, can you elaborate a little bit more upon why Generation Z students may find this as a very, a very beneficial thing for their, their travels? Sure. So the, the second part of your question, Stephen, was about why this would appeal to Generation Z. Um, I, I think we all know that what generation, what drives Generation Z and what's formed their world. Th this is a generation that have never felt safe. They probably just about remember 9-11, financial crisis uh, uh, and so on. So th their world has never been um, secure for them. Um, this in turn has prompted them to want to look for that security, both in their own lives and in the world around them. And it's an easy step over to looking for a greener world for, for this generation. Um, we all know that Generation Z, just like millennials, uh, are looking for experiences. But unlike millennials, Generation Z specifically are looking for experiences that lend value to themselves or broader society. Um, so, that answers the second part of your question. Sorry, what was the first? The first part is how, how have the students reacted to it so far? Ah, very positively. Um, 
for us, it's important to um, signpost the experience that students will have when they come and study with us. And, and of course, for students whose flights will be carbon offset by their education organization, that's very easy to do before they even get on the plane. Um, it's important for us to put our students in the right mindset of being sustainable. Um, as soon as they get on the plane, they're aware of that flight being carbon offset, every, every single one of our students. Um, and as soon as they arrive, everybody has an orientation about the importance of sustainability um, for FIE um, and also what FIE staff do. Um, this is something that um, we want to be an exemplar effect and for the students, um, they, they can all see that we as an education organization are putting a big flag in the sand and saying, look, we're carbon offsetting all of your flights. Um, we're reducing the carbon we consume through initiatives like Meat Free Mondays. Um, we, we have a, an annual student global leadership conference. So their entire experience is all, of, all about being sustainable. Excellent, thank you. Uh, moving on to Sean. Um, one of the questions that, that I get quite a bit when I talk to people about carbon offsetting is, is how do these climate uh, carbon calculators actually work? There's so many of them out there. What, what sort of um, things do we look for in a carbon calculator that can help us choose the right one? So this is a good question because if you look online, um, there's, there's probably hundreds of different carbon calculators you can go for. Um, so the way that we've actually developed it in Edinburgh is to develop our own system because we know exactly what the, the calculation being used is. And that's one of the, the key issues is finding that transparency in the figures being used um, and, and a clear methodology, really, a clear calculation that you can um, use on different scenarios. Um, so making sure that whatever you've got is, is clear and the data that is behind that is very clear as well um, and is backed up by the science. So you'll see that some carbon calculators don't use radiative forcing um, in their calculations and I personally and, and we as an institution believe that's not correct because there is a, uh, an additional impact from releasing these carbon emissions high in the atmosphere um, and that should be accounted for in these carbon calculations. Excellent. Yes, it is, it, is a, it is a bit of a messy business trying to figure out which, which carbon cal calculator works best for your situation, but th thanks for your answer. Um, going back to Martina, um, your, your presentation showed an initiative that operates at the university-wide scale. From where in the university did your initiative get its start? Was it championed by senior management at the beginning or was it more of a ground up initiative? Okay, well, it was definitely a ground up initiative. It was conceived by our office, so the international office and myself and my colleagues drove the proposal. And then afterwards we proposed it, we brought it at the university wide level. The first uh, contact that was instrumental to us was the sustainability office we are closely working with. And uh, this will be um, a trigger to help us get into the municipality that will be, of course, necessary to implement these sort of activities, especially when it comes to uh, three planning. So it was really a bottom up approach. And in this sense, um, we were triggered by the new Erasmus Charter for Higher Education uh, that every uni European university was called to, uh, to draft last spring. And a um, new section was introduced in the charter asking specifically for environmental action. And that was really um, uh, the trigger for us to draft the proposals that we had in mind. So that's how it went. Excellent, thank you. Um, here's a question that's come in in the Q&A that I really, really like. And it's both for, I think, Sean and probably Mark. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, sorry, sorry, it's going to be for uh, Mark and, and Martina. What are the possibilities for incorporating carbon insetting rather than offsetting? That is not outsourcing the problem to other people and places, but dealing with it internally where we live and supporting local priorities and needs, thereby also closing the loop between the domains of education and offsetting by actively involving students in climate learning and taking action. Okay, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, well, what, I'm, what comes to my mind is that about uh, students' involvement. Uh, yeah, I think we think that it is um, instrumental and necessary. And uh, what I propose in the 
uh, in the presentation was actually a short part of the overall plan that we want to implement and involving students, raising awareness among them on climate action is some of the core contents that we want to implement. So I'm not sure whether this answers the question, actually. I, I think, go ahead, Mark. I'll have a go. Um, I guess there are two parts of, of the answer I'd like to give here. Um, one of the benefits we found of carbon offsetting with um, a partner, a specialist carbon offsetting partner, is that um, offsetting flights or other modes of transportation is, is measurable. Um, and having a, a, a measurable means to report back to various stakeholders, whether it's parents, students, um, our partner colleges, is a real benefit. Um, carbon calculators will, will also allow local travel to be calculated, of course. Um, but that's kind of skirting around your question. Um, your, your question is more about what we can be doing locally. I, I, I don't know off the top of my head how far it can be accurately measured. Um, we, we know, of course, that um, planting trees locally would be a great thing. But um, I have to say that for a sense of for the sense of community and the broader social benefits of insetting through various projects like um, working with local charities, for instance, um, it, it undoubtedly brings social good. Um, all of the first year students that come and study with FIE undertake um, a course that we have called First Year Forward, where we actively involve them with our local communities. Um, it's very difficult to measure um, what sort of carbon um, insetting that would produce. Um, I'd say that the best approach is, is a mixed one where you're doing both. You're measuring through offsetting, but you're also producing that social good through what you can do locally. Very good, very good, thank you. I just got the uh, warning, boy, that flew by very fast. And you know what, we could have uh, had an entire three hour conversation on this. But before we uh, hand back to the uh, organizers, can we see the results of the poll, please? Here we go. So if we look at this, there are only 8% of institutions that are actively up and running, it seems, in terms of uh, reducing carbon emissions from travel. And another 24% uh, are committed to doing it, but the actions are not yet in place, but will be in place shortly. And then uh, a combined 69% really don't have this all settled. So that sounds like something that we could maybe discuss further in a podcast or something like that. Anyways, thank you very much for joining us. I'd like to thank Mark, Sean, and Martina for being part of our panel. And now I'd like to hand it back to Ailsa.